Next, we follow an artist to take a closer look at this unique collections of his. Colin Siyuan Chinnery is a British artist as well as a curator. Though born in Britain, he has deep connections to China. He spent college years studying Chinese culture, and he returned to Beijing, where his mother was born and raised, embarking on a sound project back in the year 2013. Street hawkers calling out their wares, chirping cicadas, and pigeon whistles. The lost sounds of traditional Beijing life can be still heard in Collins Museum. Before we began our conversation, we did listen to the neighborhood noises that have completely disappeared, though, in the city. So this was my first foray into sound, okay. uh, my first project. Um, and what it does is it really explores one particular aspect of Beijing culture, and that is the commercial sounds, the sounds of selling things mm -hmm. in old Beijing before you know 1949. So you can you can hear you can hear um, recreation of an ambience mm -hmm. according to season, or hear individual sounds. Right. So what let's go like with the individual sounds. Let's first uh, listen to the only sound that we can still hear in Beijing today. Okay, what yeah, is it's it? called the Zheng Jing Gui. And here you'll know what I mean. Oh, right. So right. you know what this is, right? So the one who is sharpening the knives and everything, huh? Yeah, that's right, that's yeah. right. So there's several metal plates placed together, strung together, and when you when you when you wave it wave it like this. Yeah. Then they, they, it's like fish scales. They clap, yeah. one they clap yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another one, very uh, important sound that's no longer extant now, uh -huh. but was extremely important is this. Beautiful sound. Yes. I've never heard it. This twanging thing is called a huanto. And oh. what it was is the hair, the barber. Oh, I see. The barber. Now, calling out everybody to come out and have the haircut. Now this sound still exists about 15 years ago, but now it's completely disappeared. But it was really important in Qing Dynasty because in those days men all had to have oh, that's right. the front of the head shaved. Exactly. So this used started off as a military as a as a military order, uh -huh. an edict from the emperor. When you heard that sound, every every man had to come out and had his have his hair shaved at the front, right? and with no exception, it was the law. And then it, eventually it just became the sound of the barber. I see. Yeah. So uh, do you want to hear some uh, singing sounds, hawking I sounds? Yeah, yeah, okay. So Your favorite one, maybe. Um, okay, tell me. Okay. So let me see. Uh, so it was, they sell all kinds of funny things. Oh, um, all the snacks, right? Yeah, so the, this is a midnight snack. Um, midnight snack. Midnight snack. I hate those ones because they usually <laughs> make me fat. But anyway, yeah, go exactly. ahead. <laughs> there has to be a rhythm to it that people recognize. Right. And then, so they know what's like. Yes. So, so, so they're like uh, living in their own courtyards, right? They're yeah. not walking out, but they can hear these sounds exactly. from the hutong, and then they can judge whether they come, come out to come get out. the bow or exactly. not. Oh, exactly, exactly. that's nice. You were telling me earlier that very few people that could still sing these things, right? There's only one person left in Beijing. He's 95 years old. Oh. I've been recording him last year. Uh, I recorded him a few times. And then, um, and then I became busy with other projects, and I wanted to come back and record the rest of his repertoire. Mm -hmm. But then, um, but then the, the whole... COVID-19 started. Yeah. He's the only person who actually uh, sold these things for a living to make a, you know, he was wow. uh, in pre-revolution China. I really uh, enjoyed every sound in this magical machine. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there will be a longer list of sounds. In the I'm future. going to update it this year, hopefully. Again, I was disrupted by uh, the, the pandemic. But um, I've already got everything prepared, a lot, lot more sounds uh, to put in here, uh, including pigeon whistles and all those things. I'm looking forward to pigeon whistles up the yeah. most. <laughs> Colin has a unique approach to appreciating the city of Beijing. Kickstarting the project in 2013, Colin worked to record the sounds of traditional city life before they disappear altogether. But it has never been an easy task. In our conversation, he explained how hard it is to capture the most 
vivid sound. It looks like you like sounds, don't you? Uh, yes, I'm very interested in sounds. Yeah. How many sounds have you collected from old Beijing? Uh, I haven't counted really, but um, I think it must be over a hundred, somewhere around that. So uh, really, it's in its early stages. Uh, so I've collected not that many sounds, but there's a lot more to do. So I'm really just at the beginning of the process. Among all the sounds, which, what are the sounds that you like the most? I think it's the sound that's probably my favorite uh, sound memory um, of old Beijing, or not old Beijing, but Beijing of my, uh, when I was younger, uh, pigeon whistles. The way that Beijing people keep pets is not the same as like in the West, you know, have dogs and cats and things like that. Um, Beijingers, they like a different kind of other way of, of uh, relating to pets, and sound is one of the most important things for them, you know songbirds and insects that chirp and uh, pigeon whistles well I mean people are all around the world they're pigeon fanciers yes right all around the world and they you know they raise pigeons they keep they breed very beautiful varieties of pigeons but in Beijing they make pigeons sing using whistles what they do is that they put they attach whistles on their um, tail feathers so that when they fly in the air the wind from uh, the flight uh, creates the, 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 the whistle. The chorus of yeah. sound. And the whistles themselves are very complex. They're not just a, a simple whistle. One whistle might have as many as 15 or even 20 smaller whistles attached. Mm. So um, when you have several pigeons flying in the air, there are deeper sounds and there are higher sounds. and It creates a kind of uh, very complex sound. I made one uh, good recording, but it still wasn't perfect because the season wasn't quite right. Uh, what so has to be the season? Winter is the best season. Uh, the pigeons, they, they can fly a long time without getting tired. Summer is impossible because they're actually changing feathers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you attach the whistle to their, to their tail feathers, it might just fall off. The this thing is, is really a comprehensive project. You have to yeah. know all the subjects exactly. in order to put them together. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and anyway, they're too hot. They can't, you know, can't be bothered flying. Yeah. So the best season is winter. And I, I did this in spring where it was getting warmer. So they flew for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and they, they couldn't be bothered, and they went back into their coops. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm I have to try again this year. So um, you have to court the pigeons all the time. Yeah, I have to court different people, different <laughs> pigeons uh, all, all the time yeah. to get the right recording. It's not the, just the sounds, but the things related to the sounds, the people we've met, the ambience, the taste, the smell, the everything. What are they to you? I like the idea of of a medium that can, can communicate quite directly on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started exploring uh, the sounds like almost like a part of history. And I also get a lot of people who come up to me and they, they hope that I can uh, record sounds that haven't been recorded before. Or dear to their hearts, right? Yeah, dear to them, yeah, exactly. And that's why the next phase of my project, I want society to participate mm. in uh, what my project is called Sound Terminus. Can and the public can contribute. Exactly. Colin's deep connection to China comes not only from his studies of Chinese culture, but more importantly from his roots. He told me some very interesting stories about his family. Family history. <laughs> So I guess we should start with my great-grandfather. Ah. It's my, my maternal grandmother's father, yeah. uh, Lin Fupeng. So we can see his, the difference of his attire when he was a government official in the Qing Dynasty, when he was wearing you know, uh, Qing Dynasty robes. And then after that, he, uh, after the revolution, in the Republican era, he was um, a government minister, and then he turned into a very different kind of looking man. Um, <laughs> And this is really his house. And he is the one who introduced the whistle, the police whistle. That's right. Yeah, that, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that I could remember. We're very familiar with that. And here's a kind of cute photograph of my mother. Uh, so this is already the courtyard, right? This is already the, this courtyard. Yeah. And when it used to be a garden, and it's my, my mother riding a donkey. And, and looking very happy. That um, sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It also shows the size of the courtyard, quite big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a donkey could run. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so the grandma, grandpa, of course. That's right. This is uh, 
or in the 50s when they're living in, in uh, London, uh, yeah. this is somewhere in Europe, I don't know where. Yeah. Um, and here we have a photograph which is uh, interesting. This is the last days of my grandmother's life. Oh. Um, she was oh, already... Your grandma. Yeah. Your in, mom. In Fuhua, my mother, myself. Um, this is in 1990. And... Um, and this was just a few days before she passed away. But when she was wheeled into this uh, courtyard, which didn't look anything like the courtyard that she grew up in, it was already a, it was a nursery school. We saw these kids. Right. Uh, most of the buildings were already, already not there anymore. But as soon as she came into this courtyard, she said, "My mother's calling me for dinner." Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So she just knew she her childhood memory came back to her. She knew she was home and, and, and she had a memory of her mother calling her for dinner. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And you were working very hard in order to get her settled into Beijing and also... Well, this was when she was in the hospital. So yeah. this is 1990 and she was, you know, she was already in hospital last days. Well, in Chinese we say, Lo you know, uh, the, the leaf falls down and back into its own earth. Um, so I was only 19 years old then, so most of, my, most of the work was done by my mother. That must be quite an experience or a moment for you, huh? Yeah, I, th I think it was, it was very, yeah, it was interesting because also when she came back, um, I realized that she was very important because uh, all, all sorts of people wanted to be you involved. You didn't know that beforehand. I knew she was famous, but then you don't know until you're in the situation and everybody wants to be involved somehow. Mm -hmm. And it became very complicated. Um, yeah. yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And this is uh, the, the courtyard we just uh, have been is the one that hosted so many people. That's right, yeah. Um, back in my... Uh, Great grandfather's days, uh, these famous people like Qi Bai Shi and, uh, and, and oh, Chen well. Shizang, and, and yeah, yeah. All these, these people who were. Um, biggest names of biggest our time. Names, yeah, yeah. Um, they were frequent visitors. Uh, my, my great my grandfather, um, he had uh, friends both uh, in the Western intellectual circles and in China. Mm. And of course, we all know people like Hu Shi. Uh, Xu Bei Hong, uh, you know, Xu Zhimo. Um, so these people used to um, be the part Chinese of Chinese literati. Yeah, uh -huh. be part of their intellectual life here. Um, There's some amazing Bernard Shaw, international figures. That's right, yeah. Um, Tagore wow. came to this courtyard mm -hmm. where my grandmother hosted him. Yeah. Okay, this third generation. Yeah, um, yeah. In Chinese, we call it uh, 一代不如一代. <laughs> <laughs> you really think that way? <laughs> yeah, well, it's hard to live up to that, you know, their their uh, their achievements. And yes, that, so. yes. So I won't try. <laughs> <laughs> Finding identity has always been the theme of your uh, projects, it seems, but. You yourself, I'm sure you've been asked that question for many times. Uh, the identity issue is also an interesting one. This courtyard, for example, we are sitting in, belongs to your mom and your grandparents on your mother's side. And they are some of the most influential cultural figures of their time. So how do you see your own identity vis-a-vis -vis their generations and what they created? Um, I don't see a direct creative lineage between my grandparents and myself. I think How they come? lived in a complete. Well, they lived in a completely different era, um, and I didn't grow up with them, mm. so I don't have a direct, let's say, you know, inspiration uh, relationship with their lives or or, or them living with them uh, from a family perspective or an intellectual perspective. The other thing is that I I'm. I'm not a big fan of um, of attempting to bask in your, you know, ancestors' so glory. So past glory, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, although I can I can take pride in the fact that I come from this family. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it's really nice to know that my grandparents made, you know, an impact on the intellectual life of their time. Mm. Their generation, being considered by many here today, as quite significant and certainly the lives of their generation as a whole.
yeah. can be described as turbulent, but certainly exciting in retrospect. Um, how would you see our generation vis-a-vis -vis theirs? They, they, went through, uh, they went through the Second World War, they went through the Civil War, they yeah. went through uh, incredibly momentous um, periods of history. Right now, we're at uh, peace, at least we are. I think um, how to find yourself as an individual in this world that is like um, becoming so complicated without being at war mm. uh, is one of the most interesting things, I think, uh, as an artist. Um, because on the surface, everything's calm, but yeah. at the same time, you know that it's not. And what that means for you, and how to how do you relate to that as a person? Uh, we all know that the politics of the world is becoming very polarized. Mm. Um, so we know that something is happening. Yeah. And it's uh, very easy to uh, say, oh, it's because of this, or it's because of that. It can't be just because of one thing. It's, it's a whole complex issue of um, of eras changing or emerging or splitting apart. How that relates to you as a human being when you need to feel grounded in a creative practice or in a, a certain identity yeah. or what even identity means. That's the complexity of right now. People talk about China and uh, a lot of those are stereotypes but a lot of those are also things that Chinese or people here in China including you that have not been thinking much about. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting as to should we think more these days about what we are experiencing and about ourselves in the context or shall we continue to move on with the speed and the rhythm we used to have? I'm only saying I can't talk about society at large because it's way too big for me but I can talk about myself because I think I face, I face exactly the same issues as the rest of society. Mm. It's like what, what do I do to ensure that I survive professionally mm. and do something that I feel that I can enjoy? for a long, long time. Mm. Not just in the moment, just like just now, uh, and then make, it, make a lot of money and then think about what to do next. Uh, let me just pull in, once again, your mm. grandpa's, mm. grandma, grandpa's generation. They face a lot of questions for the very first time. For example, whether to learn from the West, what to learn from the West, and where is their future in their home country or outside? Uh, they certainly give their answers. Yeah. But a lot of these questions that they didn't have a definitive answer of their generation coming back to us again. Well, one of the reasons why I think this generation, the generation now, finds the Republican era so interesting and the writers of that generation, my grandparents' generation, so interesting is that I feel that China has two traditional traditions. One is uh, Chinese traditional culture that mm -hmm. goes all the way back to Confucius and the preaching era, the philosophers, I and all see. that. That's a you know the Chinese traditional culture, but we don't live in traditional China. We live in modern China. The other tradition that I think is very very closely related to modern China, who we are in China, is the Republican era. That is in a way that's where we come from. A lot of our thinking, a lot of our lifestyles, mm -hmm. a lot of why we think the way we think. And the language we speak. We and the speak. language we yeah. speak, the clothes we wear, everything. Mm. So much of who we are in China now comes from that Republican era. And that's in a way our roots. Um, and, but very few people frame it like that. But it is true. Mm. Um, and so that's why it's so interesting because many people when they feel lost they want to go back to their roots. Mm. Some people go back to writing calligraphy and, and, and going back further but a lot of people love reading that literature because it speaks to us now because it's actually our modern, the, the roots of our modern existence. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very short period of time, uh, it was bursting with life. When you look at each individual work, okay, they might be not the best works of literature in all of humanity but they mean a lot to us now here in China. Um, and we're facing the same problems. We're facing the same problems all over again. Um, so it's not necessarily that anybody has a definitive solution. It's about um, thinking about it in inspired terms rather than in dogmatic terms. Mm. And, and that's what we as, like, when we're doing a, trying to live a creative life that we're trying to avoid at all costs dogmatic ways of thinking 
on ways of living. Mm. Thank you so much for um, inviting us over here. And uh, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Colin Suyuan Chinnery. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside. That's the name of our program. Or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.